Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Matt Caton, and I am joined today with Dan Rasmus. Dan, as uh, uh, I've known Dan for many years, uh, I know Dan. You've worn a lot of hats. I know you as a an author, uh, a writer. He has a fantastic website, SeriousInsights.net. That's all things technology and methodologies and and uh reviews articles just a, a fascinating uh website to spend some time on uh dan did i miss anything there <laughs> no i appreciate that i'm also a poet so i had a poem come out this month uh still still writing after all these years so oh fantastic uh, yeah yeah i think we share a lot in common um you know, we met, uh, gosh, I don't even know how long ago, years ago, but, uh, years ago. uh but yeah, I, I know we've got, uh, we're both a little bit of tech gurus. Uh, well, tech geeks, I would, I would put yeah. myself in, I'll put you in the guru category. Okay. <laughs> you know, Dan and I, by the yeah. way, are, um, in our home offices today. This is our, our commuters with computers and coffee or Pepsi depending on your choice. <laughs> in, in I know you <laughs> and I don't have the Star Trek cup. I need to I need to sci-fi my co my home coffee mug. When did you first discover the brain and and what, you know, what sticks out in your memory is, you know, what drew you in? Yeah, so so I was in aerospace uh working at Hughes Aircraft at the time. Um I had just joined the Space and Communications group. Uh, and I was asked to think about the future of technology uh, and to think about ways of understanding our current technology as well. That's one of the first things you do when you think about the future, say, what do we have today? Uh, and um, I was, there was kind of a confluence of things between me getting introduced to scenario planning, which I continue to practice today through Peter Schwartz's book, The Art of the Long View, and then having to inventory, you know, what kind of applications do we have? What kind of PCs do we have, et cetera, right? Uh, and I think I was probably introduced to the brain via one of my Macintosh connections. I wrote for a lot of Macintosh magazines back then, Mac Week, Mac Today, Mac User, et cetera. Uh, and I know I've written about the brain in some of those after that. Uh, but I said, let me try this thing out. And um, the multi-dimensional view of being able to kind of organize things without having to organ over overthink the organization ahead of time uh was what appealed to me mm -hmm. uh and this was i think the late 1990s so it's been a while um, yeah and i've i've found a use for it in every job that i've had since then what do you recall that has 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 changed what has evolved most significantly, I would guess, I would say to you over the years. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the the, the multi-platform and the web, because when it first came out, there was no web. Um, so co connecting to, to things that aren't on your computer, you know, at the time, quite frankly, it was competing with, I don't even remember the names of some of the Macintosh programs I was using that were doing <laughs> things like document management. I had a scanner in my office and I still scan everything. I don't believe in paper. Um, and so uh, I was scanning things in and I had a document repository. Uh, but at the time, the brain didn't quite connect to some of those things. And so, you know, I now have, uh, you know, assets in it that uh, I can store uh, everything from Shakespeare plays to uh, PDFs about research on how to do scenario planning better or research to support uh, some of the scenarios that I'm writing, right? So mm -hmm. that's a that's a major uh, issue. Um, you know, it's it's not all blue anymore. Used to be used to be kind of be. It was, <laughs> I remember there's there was kind of one theme, and uh, all the brains look the same. They don't have to look the same anymore. Uh, so so that's a good thing. And I believe, and it's hard for me to remember because again, I've been using it for so long. Um, I think there were tags and types in the early days. I think those have become better and how they are facilitated through the process uh, is, is more elegant. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, you guys have added all kinds of things over the years about reporting and history and lots of stuff that, you know, it, it, I, I think there, there were kind of the, the nubs of some of those ideas from Harlan in there and <laughs> that, you know, he's been able to, you know, take the time. There are very few platforms, you know, I have to kind of give you guys kudos. There's very few platforms uh, that have been around for so long 
that still kind of hold to their core principles. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things I really appreciate about the the product. How do you categorize the brain and how do you compare the brain to to other products that uh, that are out there? Yeah, I, I, for me, it, it it's a combination of things. I don't think it fits in one category, uh, which I think, you know, from a marketing standpoint, sometimes can be an issue, right? So you're competing against multiple categories. Um, but, uh, you know, I do use it for uh, mostly for information storage, retrieval and analysis, right? So and I and I use information in a very broad sense. Mm-hmm. So everything from an idea that I have that I just kind of stick in there to not lose it uh, to very robust things like competitive intelligence. Uh, I mentioned, you know, for analytics of uh, computer architect, you know, or, or business architectures, right? So being able to talk about the, here are the processes here, you know, and then being able to tag them and saying, here are the processes that are good, that we don't have to touch. Here are the processes that need improvement. And then being able to, with one click, say, show me all the processes that need improvement that are also manufacturing processes, right? And I could color code those and give them a tag that say, that's a manufacturing process. And in one click, I've got the answer to the, here's the things I should be working on uh, because it allows me to do that analysis. Yeah. Um, and I know from, from from a conversation recently that Harlan said I was one of the more uh, robust users of the tags and categories feature. Uh, I encourage people to really explore that. I think that's, uh, you know, for for information, for, for prov- providing metadata and quick analysis yeah. on things, it's absolutely fascinating. So here's my scenario planning brain, right? Um, this is the core work that I do with lots mm-hmm. of companies. Uh, how about to think about the future? And here's a list of scenario research. That's fairly unstructured, right? I get a notice, there's a PDF. Uh, I, get a, I have a subscription to some free service that sends me academia.com, I think it is, that sends me that here's a new PDF you should read on scenario planning. And if I don't have a copy already, I download it and I put it in the brain. I have I don't sit here and do a bunch of analysis on those. I may at some point, I don't have to right now. On the flip side, when I look at the future of work, uh, these are all of the uncertainties related to the future of work, right? So it's a pretty extensive list, um, almost overwhelming. <laughs> but if I if I'm engaging a client in the future of libraries, I click on this one, and here's the critical ones for the future of libraries, and they are tagged. And this is a tag; it's not just drag and drop them in, right? So they're actually tagged as future of library and it's a critical uncertainty for them. So this is where we spend most of our time talking about what they mean, how they're related to each other. Uh, And then I can say, well, I'm now doing a future of work client. There's the critical future of work uncertainties. Now these may change. I may have an interview and they may say, oh, there's something else on this big list that should be on the smaller list. That's just a matter of them popping over here and saying, I need to add a new tag and what's, you know, where does that go? That becomes now a critical uncertainty, right? The types I use pretty extensively in this as well. So I have scenario uncertainties um, uh, and I can say, okay, so show me the ones that are just social. And so there's the social uncertainties. I can see the ones that are uh, technological uncertainties. And so these are the ones related to technology. So it helps hone down the complexity. I can see the big list. They're all uncertainties, but they have subtypes uh, and uh, they live here. And as you can see, there's a few a few things that are related. So if I look at, you know, the reach of Internet access, it's got some items that are related. They're on the same list, Mm -hmm. but it's, you know, it's the reach of Internet access, access to necessary and emerging technology and the state state of public technology infrastructure. Those are both related ideas. Uh, and in scenario planning, that's important because if all three of those end up on the list, they almost act as proxies for each other. And so you just want to be aware as you're building this out. And again, those are things you can do that not in the heat of the moment, but as you're doing the analysis uh, of the of the tool of the of the concepts, you can go back in and uh, add those kinds of features to it. But at the end of the day, what I store in here are the scenarios themselves, right? So I click on the scenarios, future of work 2035, 
there are these four worlds. So I've now incorporated the slideware into the brain. So here are the four worlds. Here are the uncertainties that are driving those, the affinity for work and uh, the state of global cooperation. And when I click on flat world, I have those uncertainties. I have the presentation that gives me the overview of that world. And then for each one of these, there's an individual instance. And this is pretty manual process, but I go through it because there's value at the back end of having it all in the same place of duplicating all of the uncertain, the critical uncertainties and doing the comma trick on them for each one of these instances, right? So this is economic focus of the United States in the flat world, which then has its own value, right? Attempting to reestablish economic dominance and hold on to military superiority, right? So that's an instance. Every one of these has its own version. And if I go back up to... Uh, the general ones, I have the great rebuilding. It has its own set of um, drivers and its mm -hmm. own strong circular economy for electronics and plastics. Food becomes compost and energy, right? So as you're building these, you build narratives. Um, I don't have those easily shareable this morning. These are the these are kind of the, the summary versions of this. But every one of those becomes a character in this story. And as you can see in the, the slideware side, there's an uncertainty and its value. And as you're evaluating the, here are my plans, this gives you a very robust way of viewing that world through the lens of social, technological, economic, environmental, and political uncertainties, right? And so in this future, it's no longer uncertain, right? I've told you the answer. And then you say, okay, does my plan actually accommodate that future? Is it, does it work in that future? Is there something from that future that forces me to think about an idea that I haven't had yet, right? Um, because I haven't given myself permission to go to that future. Uh, and so it's used for innovation uh, and it's used for uh, uh, assumption challenging and it's used to avoid surprises, right? So because we practice the future, if that kind of future happens, you're better prepared for it. 